listening to episode 84 of the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast and what you're about to hear is a conversation with Dr. Sarah Myhill, who is a doctor in Wales. She's been practicing medicine since 1981, so she's got a few runs on the board, which you, you're going to pick up straight away just with the depth in which she talks all about her new book, which is called The Underactive Thyroid. The subtitle of her book, which I think is even more telling, is Do It Yourself Because Your Doctor Won't. So for those of you who are struggling with your thyroid health management or you can't find a doctor that really understands or is helping you manage it well, then this could be definitely a conversation you want to stick around and listen to because that really is the premise of the book. It's how to manage your thyroid health on your own, uh, step by step, uh, right from, you know, and she talks about it being in a logical order of progression as to how you manage uh, or even go about diagnosing whether you even have a thyroid condition. So I hope you really enjoy this conversation. Uh, I am going to put the links to this book and she's written many other books and runs lots of trainings. So you want to check out her website, but I'm putting the links to the, you know, some of the core, like the couple of core books in the description below. Uh, and I would really appreciate it if you're going to buy the book, you buy it through that link because that will help to support the show because it's an Amazon affiliate link and it obviously helps support the guests by um, buying the book. So that would be really helpful. Also stick around to the end for the Kiss Thyroid Coaching segment, just helping you to stop and reflect just for a minute on what you've just listened to and how you can apply it to your life. Well, welcome, Dr. Sarah Myhill, to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. This is going to be um, a really interesting conversation about your new book and all your wealth of experience of working with thyroid patients. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you all the way from Wales. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I've read you've got a new book out called The Underactive Thyroid, and um, I've had a good read of it. Uh, and yeah, there's lots of lots of really good information. So we're just going to touch on some of those, some of the things that you bring up in the book. Obviously, we want people to buy the book, so we're not going to unveil all your secrets <laughs> in this podcast. Right. That's right. Um, you can unveil them all. That's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think there's time. There's so many different topics that you cover that I'm sure we won't, you know, we won't be able to cover all of it. But before we kind of get into the guts of that, I'm just wondering if you can just Tell us sort of what got you, you know, you're, you're, you're a doctor, you've been a doctor for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. What got you into thyroid health, um, you know, personally, okay. professionally? Like give us a little bit of background if you don't mind. Well, I, I qualified as a doctor in 1981 and went straight into general practice in, in UK, NHS general practice. And you know, I thought, you know, I'd qualify at the top of the year. I thought, you know, this is going to be easy. I know it all. And I very quickly came down to earth with a major bump because, of course, people want to know why they have got problems, you know, why they have eczema, why they have asthma, why they have chronic fatigue. And that question is not addressed at all in medical education. And I quickly realized that medical education is not an education. It's a brainwashing. And it's a boiled down to here's a symptom, here's a drug that suppresses that symptom. And of course, all medicine is, um, all modern Western medicine is founded on that principle. And the awful thing is that Big Pharma now bankrolls medical education. So I find myself right back at base asking the question why? Why do people have migraine? Why do they have arthritis? arthritis and the most difficult question of all was why are we fatigued and in the 1980s when I was in general practice the commonest um, um, presenting symptom was the TATT tired all the time symptom and um, we had absolutely no good answers for that whatsoever and so the last 40 years um, have uh, I have spent thinking about that question um, uh, exploring every possible blind avenue that there is, because there are so many people out there with TATT tired all the time. And of course, the pathological version of that is chronic fatigue syndrome uh, and myalgic encephalomyelitis. So if we fast forward to 2023, where I've learned a thing or two in the last um, four decades, um, uh, I, we now know that thyroid is an essential part of energy delivery mechanisms. And all the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome uh, can be explained by poor energy delivery mechanisms. 
And in thinking about that, there are four very important players. And the analogy which I use, because I get it and my patients get it, is the car analogy. So for your car to go, you've got to have the right fuel in the tank. And that's all about diet and gut function. You've got to have the mitochondrial engine, and that's my special area of interest. And together with um, John McLaren Howard and Professor Norman Booth, we published three papers on this issue. And then you have to have the thyroid accelerator pedal, which is where you come in, of course, and the adrenal gearbox. And it's a balancing up of those four issues that we need to address energy delivery mechanisms. And on the back of that, I might add in uh, one extra one, um, uh, which is... Um, it's no good having a factory or a car with all um, the players present. They've got to be in the right three-dimensional space. And I mm -hmm. think that has much to do with something called the fourth phase of water, um, which we can talk about, making sure that molecules are arranged on cell membranes and around and enzyme systems in the right three-dimensional space for the most efficient movement of electrons around, which, of course, is what energy delivery mechanism is all about, ultimately, biochemically speaking. So I've crushed four year, 40 years into four minutes. I hope that gives you an outline of where we're at and how the thyroid fits in here. Yeah, look, I think for all the, you know, all the patients that have heard, oh, it's just a thyroid problem, just take a pill, you'll be fine. <laughs> just that four minutes says, uh-uh. <laughs> I mean, even just that is it, it, it's it's so not complicated. Like yeah. It's not like that, but it, it sounds complicated, but it isn't. You know, it's mm. like building a house. I mean, we have any number of houses, you know, all over the world. Um, but the basic construction of the, them is the same. You need a foundation stone. You need walls. You need windows and doors. You need a roof. You know, it's uh, but there are lots of variations on that theme. And it's exactly the same with sorting that, you know, the thyroid out. It's an essential part of, of building that house, if you like. And what we also know, what I also am quite certain about now, is things have to be done in a certain order. So there's no mm. point sticking a chimney on if you've got no foundation stone and no walls. And, it, and so is the case with energy delivery mechanisms. And the foundation stone is the fuel in the tank. It's the diet and gut function. And for many people, you know, if they get that in place and they do that well, then so much else falls into place. But as we age... Um, things get comp things do get a bit more complicated and systems fail and we are living in a very poisoned world and we are poisoning our thyroids out of existence so the underactive thyroid is now becoming increasingly common but we so we have to start off with the diet and gut function and get that right and then we have to put in the place the mitochondrial engine and then we can apply the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox and the point here is that for the mitochondrial engine to go, you've got to have the right fuel in the tank. And the effects of thyroid hormones and adrenal hormones manifest on the mitochondrial engine. They make it go faster. They adjust its, mm -hmm. its speed you know, from second to second and from day to day and from hour to hour. So for the thyroid and the mitochondria to impact, I beg your pardon, for the thyroid and the adrenals to impact, you've got to get the mitochondrial engine right. So there is an order to these things. We start off saying mm. diet and gut function, sort out the mitochondria, and then we look at the thyroid and the adrenal glands. So it might sound complicated if you're listening to this for the first time, but actually the progression is entirely logical. I've been tr using this for some decades on uh, indirectly and directly some thousands of patients, and we know that it works. So this is a well-walked path. Hmm. And and I'm looking forward to diving into some, yeah, some of those things. And I know you've written, I mean, you've written this book, but you've written a whole book on um, the diet component too. So uh, we'll, we can touch on that. I'm just wondering, like in that 40 years, I mean, in terms of, I, I know what you're saying. It's, you know, you, you're trying to get to the why and understanding why do these things happen have you, I mean, from a medical perspective, have you seen a change in the way thyroid health has been managed over that 40 years? No. The way that the, the mm. conventional doctors manage thyroid health has actually got worse oh. because they no longer look at patients. They no longer look at symptoms and signs. They just look at blood tests. 
And when it comes to looking at blood tests, often there's only one thing they look at, which is the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, that may mm. be a very useful guide to the to treating primary hypothyroidism and, and diagnosing and getting the uh, dose right. But it doesn't work for secondary hypothyroidism when the problem is in the pituitary gland. So looking at blood tests can be very misleading. And it's the, you know, it's the old story with any diagnosis. You have to look at the whole picture, the patient's history, their symptoms, their signs and the blood test. And then you make a diagnosis and all diagnosis is hypothesis. We think it might be this. So you then put that hypothesis to the test. And that test is all about taking the thyroid hormones and see how that person responds. But mm. if their mitochondria aren't set up, then you're not going to get the response you need. If they haven't got the right fuel in the tank and the gut function, then that response is going to be not what you expect. And so if you just start somebody on thyroid hormones and you don't get the response that you expect, you will miss the diagnosis. So the work up that person, the, you know, the fuel in the tank, the mitochondrial engine is all part of the diagnostic process. And you will know when you've arrived when that person is back to peak performance, you know, working, you know, working at the same level as their contemporaries are you know, at work, having a fun time, de -da, de -da, de -da. then you know you have arrived. You don't know you've arrived simply by doing a few tests. So it might sound complicated, but it's, it's totally logical. And I've been very mm. naughty with this book. Um, I've called it yeah, the underactive thyroid, but the subtitle is do it yourself because your doctor won't. Now, I'm quite sure mm. this will attract lots of complaints from the medical profession. But the fact <laughs> of the matter is, the fact mm. of the matter is, there is nobody better empowered or better motivated to mm. get, the th get the whole thing right than the person themselves. Because in, you only get one life. This is not a dress rehearsal for the, for the real thing. Um, uh, we only get one life and we have to get it right in order that we can live life to its full potential. So the idea of the book, is to teach somebody, give them the rules of the game, as I call it, and the tools of the trade so they can do it themselves because their doctor won't. Shocking though that may sound. And the reason mm. for that is um, uh, doctors are educated by Big Pharma. Big Pharma is not interested in curing patients. Remember Big Pharma's mantra is, a patient cured is a customer lost. The only responsibility Big Pharma has is to its shareholders. They want to make lots of money. So the ideal scenario for Big Pharma is to have lots of sick people or half sick people needing lots of symptom suppressing drugs. That's, you know, follow the money. That's where the profits lie. The last thing you want to do is to cure somebody because that um, uh, doesn't make money at all. Yep. And so all these, all this, yeah, all the diet and lifestyle factors just get suppressed. Yeah, correct. And I, look, I, I read and I yesterday think, yeah. that the, the, the biggest selling drug in the world is a statin called atovastatin. It makes more money than you know, uh, any other drug. Uh, but um, a cardiologist in this country, Dr. Asim Malhotra, has published a book called A Statin Free Life. And mm. essentially the conclusions of that book are lifestyle measures are far more efficacious than statins. Yeah, I follow um, Dr. Malhotra on social media, actually. I really like him. Yeah, he, and all of what he's doing, <laughs> you know, and, and has been doing recently. So, yeah, he's, um, he's definitely he's inspiring. And, yeah, and look, yeah, the more people we can get off medication, the better, right? <laughs> and, look, one of the things, yeah, in this pod, you know, I guess one of the, the missions I have with this podcast is to spread the word that we can be empowered as patients. We can have hope, you know, it doesn't have to just be take your pill, you, you know, that's all you can do. Um, yeah, sure. Take, I mean, I'm still on thyroid medication, but do a whole lot of other things. So I think it's a, it can be a case of both and it doesn't have to be either or and, but no, there's hope. There's lots of things that we can do, but yeah, as you say, you know, no one else is going to do it for you. <laughs> we wish that they would. We know in that sort of Western medical model, it would be nice. Like, yeah, look, if, if a pill would solve it all, I'm, I'm sure we'd all just want to take it, but it just doesn't work that way. So. Correct. Correct. It's the yeah. old story. Always ask the question why. And it's worse than that because what pills do is they suppress symptoms and we have mm. symptoms for, for very good reasons. Symptoms protect us from ourselves. So, for example, you know, we all have a certain bucket of energy that we can spend in a day. 
Now, if you spend more energy than is available in that bucket, then you will die. You will die because you don't have the energy for the heart to work, for the brain to work, for the body to work. And so the body and the brain have to give you symptoms to stop you emptying that bucket of energy. And, um, and those symptoms have to be very nasty symptoms. If they're not very nasty symptoms, then you won't stop spending energy and you will mm -hmm. progress to death. So um, by symptom suppression, that's a very dangerous business. Now, with, when it comes to the symptom, when it comes to uh, the symptom of fatigue, the most common symptom suppressing medication that we use are addictions. We use addictions to suppress those unpleasant symptoms of fatigue or stress. Addictions like um, um, refined sugar, uh, fruit sugar is an addiction, uh, cigarette smoking, alcohol, uh, cannabis, heroin, all these addictions are rife. And the reason for that, the reason we use them is to suppress those horrible symptoms of stress. And I think stress and anxiety are the symptoms we get when the brain knows it doesn't have the energy to deal with demands. Mm. So if I could give, if I had a patient who came to me who was stressed, if I could give them infinite energy, they could work all day, all night, uh, earn loads of money, sort out the family, rebuild the house, and they wouldn't be stressed anymore because they could do it all. But mm. all my patients I see with chronic fatigue syndrome are severely stressed because they simply don't have the energy to deal with life's, uh, the demands of life. And therefore, in, they use addictions like cigarette smoking, like cannabis, like sugar, to mask those symptoms. But it really is short-term gain, long-term pain. And the awful thing is the doctors do the same with many of their drugs. So tranquilizers, sleeping drugs, antidepressants, blood pressure drugs, um, cholesterol, these are all symptom suppressing drugs to mask that symptom. And as I say, we have symptoms for good reasons. And if you mask the symptom, you accelerate the underlying pathology. So, for example, we know that mm. a major risk factor for dementia is drugs and the, year, and the years you've been taking. The more drugs you've been taking, the longer you've been taking them, the greater your risk of dementia. And that also applies for cancer and heart disease. So it's the old story. Always ask the question why. Always address the underlying causes. And we do that through having symptoms. So if I have somebody who comes to me who's completely fit and well and bubbling with energy, I'm not going to change anything, am I? I uh, so long as they're not doing that on addiction, as long as they're mm -hmm. not doing that on sugar or, or, um, mm -hmm. or cannabis or um, uh, 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 ecstasy or amphetamines or whatever, uh, then I can say, get on with life. You, you're getting much right. But, of course, people don't mm. come to you with those, that picture, do they? No, they don't tend to. And you have to be very <laughs> proactive to come feeling that good, wouldn't you? <laughs> I was saying to someone last week, you know, I was I, the last episode, the current episode that's out's all about adrenals, which ties really lovely, you know, really perfectly into this. And I was just saying, uh, asking her the question about coffee, and I know you talk about that, I think, in one you know, there too. And I've, I've, I've just had a month. I've, I've got a month break since I've had coffee. I'm not saying I've completely quit it, but I, I haven't had any coffee for a month. And you know, and I was saying to her you know, if I didn't feel pretty crappy, I wouldn't have changed it. Like you've got to feel pretty bad before you're prepared to put the effort into change because in the end, yeah, yeah if you're feeling great, well, why would you want to? <laughs> you, you, why would you want to go through that? But when things aren't working, you know, then you are motivated to change. And so well, the, the, po the point about addictions, and I think this applies to, to all of them, is they are mm. good servants, but bad masters. So I don't drink coffee either. But you know, sometimes, you know, um, you know, if because uh, I'm no paragon of virtue, and if I go out and have a party, then I like to party and I have a few glasses of wine and I behave badly and I don't sleep so well. And the next morning, I might need a window of time to and when I've got to function. And then a small shot of coffee is very helpful. But that's maybe once a week, once a month, or occasionally. So as I say, for occasional mm. use, addictions can be very useful but you but you have to bear in mind that it's short-term gain so you, you you might get a bit of an upper but then you have to be prepared for a bit of a downer yeah so i well while we're talking about energy because i think that's one of the things i really liked about your book was you, the way you talked about energy delivery and delivery into different parts of your body and you've got some great tables in there with um that, the way they work and symptoms and um, I'm, I'm reading it on digital. So it was, you know, it was like trying looking at all the columns. It was a little bit awkward, but that, but it was fine. It was actually really helpful, actually, the way that you'd put it together like that. And so uh, can you just explain that? Because particularly in the context, you know, of hypothyroidism, 
I mean, we, we do lack energy in lots of, and it plays out in lots of different ways, doesn't it? So can you explain that a little bit? Um, um, well, uh, um, I'm, I'm not terribly sure of your question to tell the truth. Ah, um, okay. um, I mean, as I say, it, it's the, it's the, it's the four things we, we have to start off with the diet and the mitochondria and then the thyroid. Um, mm. I, I mean, I put things in tabular form because I think it's very logical. Funny enough, I had a, received mm. an email this morning from an engineer who said, I love the way you put things in tables because it's so logical because when you're reading a book, um, uh, you know, there's the logical thread, which is the writing bit, and then the tables that gives you the actual information. And you don't want to lose the logic by being bogged down in, in, in tables of information. Um, so uh, that's why I put them in. So, uh, 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 for example, when I'm, we're interpreting thyroid tests, then I put that in, in, in tables. because That's very useful to understand what the TSH means, what the T4 means, what mm. the T3 means, why you need to know all of them in order to get the best outcome. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, I think my question was more along, and it's, I apologise for not really being very clear, but you talk about, for example, like energy to the brain um, plays okay, out in symptoms. brain fog and concentration. Okay, yeah, the symptoms okay. and, and lack of energy to muscles, you know, okay. plays out in, that, that's sort of more of what I meant. Sorry, okay. I wasn't very clear. Okay, well, the point is, when, in, in starting off, you know, the um, uh, uh, with, when I see any patient, I'm obviously asking what, symptoms do you have and then we have mm. to use those symptoms to discern what's going on so um uh, if we have poor energy delivery mechanisms to the body then we get symptoms of fatigue um fatigue maybe muscle aching um, um poor stamina um, um people aren't getting their full athletic performance maybe but of course we're all fatigued at the end of the day and we have a good night's sleep that restores us. So we have to ask, is this fatigue pathological? Is this person fatigued because they're unfit? Or is this pathological fatigue? And the key feature here is the post-exertional malaise. So if you have, if you overdo things one day and you pay for it the next day, that's called post-exertional malaise, and that is pathological fatigue. That means we have overdone things the day before. Equally, if you have poor energy delivery to the brain, that will give us brain symptoms. So although the brain weighs just 2% of body weight, it consumes 20% of all the energy generated in, in the body. It's massively demanding energy. So what are the symptoms of poor energy delivery to the brain? Well, foggy brain, can't think clearly, inability mul to multitask poor short-term memory, can't problem solve. You know, These are all symptoms we get when the brain is... Uh, is going slow. And of course, about a third of the function of the brain does nothing but sort out visual information that's coming in from, from the outside world. You know, light hitting the back of, hits the back of the retina. The retina converts that light into an electrical signal that the brain then has to turn into something that we can see. And there are different parts of the brain associated with perspective, with color, with movement, with facial recognition, and all those things. And that consumes a huge amount of energy. Mm. I say about a third of the brain is occupied just with sorting out visual information because that is so important to us. And then, of course, the brain will give us symptoms if it knows it doesn't have the energy available. And we talked about that a little bit. And I think that stress, mm. anxiety, depression, these are all symptoms the brain gives us when it knows it cannot deal with demand. Mm. And then, of course, we have heart symptoms. So if you haven't got energy delivery mechanisms to the heart functioning well, then um, the heart is going to beat rather weakly. So instead of having nice strong beats, you know, and we should have about 70 to 75 beats per minute of nice strong beats, you, if you haven't got the end of it, it's a rather flabby beat. So the first thing mm -hmm. that happens is the blood, blood, the blood pressure can fall. And if the blood yeah, pressure that. gets much below about 100 over 60, then that is pathological low blood pressure. Now mm. that can create problems for the very severely afflicted uh, chronic fatigue syndrome uh, sufferer because when we stand up, we have to increase cardiac output because it's much harder pumping blood, you know, in the vertical than in the horizontal. Mm -hmm. That's why we lie down to sleep because you know it's much mm -hmm. more restful. It's, it, it uses less energy. So as soon as you stand up, you have to increase cardiac output by about twenty percent. Now, if the heart is already a bit flabby and not beating strongly, the only way it can increase cardiac output is to beat faster. 
So when people stand up, the, the, the heart beats faster, you get a tachycardia. But of course, that too is demanding of energy. That too is not mm. sustainable. And eventually the person just falls over because the blood pressure drops precipitously. Now, that clinical picture is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's not a diagnosis. It's a clinical picture. And it's a clinical picture characterized by poor energy delivery mechanisms to the heart. Of course, in the long term, that will result in heart failure and maybe tachydysrhythmias. So, you know, it's pathological in the long term and in the short term, you know, it causes this physiological response, which is very disabling because you can't stand upright. So mm. um, those are sort of symptoms we get with poor energy delivery mechanisms. Now, and of course, the thyroid is part of that. So if you had somebody who just had a very underactive thyroid, you would also see that clinical picture. And we know the underactive thyroid is a major risk factor for heart disease, you know, for, for, for dementia and, of course, for cancer. But there are some symptoms that are peculiar to the thyroid in addition to all those poor energy delivery symptoms. So often there's a, a bradycardia. The heart goes slow at rest often maybe as low as you know, 50 beats per minute, 55, 60 beats per minute. So that gives one a good clue. And then um, um, there are symptoms like fluid retention. Another name for the underactive thyroid is mixed edema. You know, and edema means you're retaining fluid. So if you retain mm -hmm. fluid around your vocal cords, then you get a croaky voice like you've been you know, smoking cigarettes for the last 20 years. Um, yeah. Some people say they've lost their singing voice. They can't hit those high notes because the chords are edematous. Mm. The, the, the face gets a bit puffy. So if you look at photographs of yourself you know, 20 years ago, if you think, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm unrecognizable because I'm all puffy, you know, puffy eyes. And blah, blah, blah. Then yeah. again, That was definitely me. I could definitely <laughs> look back um, in photos and, yeah. Uh, and again, you get um, swelling, all the tissues swell. And if the wrists swell, they can compress the nerve in the wrist and you can get carpal tunnel syndrome. And carpal tunnel mm. syndrome occurs when you get numbness and, and, and in, in, in those fingers there. So thumb, index, middle and half of the ring finger because the median nerve at the wrist is compressed. Sometimes that pre presents mm. with pain. Some people wake up in the night with tingling. In that hand, I mean, that's one way I know when I'm under dosing because I wake in the night with tingling. Oh, we'll better tweak the dose a little bit. Um, a very yeah. dear friend of mine, that's mm. how her underactive thyroid presents in pregnancy with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. And then, of course, mm. uh, thin hair, poor quality skin, loss of the eyebrows. And that's another you know, classic symptom. Uh, two symptoms that often come up, and I'm ashamed to say, I'm not quite sure of the mechanism of this, but certainly mm -hmm. these symptoms often go away when we correct the thyroid. That's low-grade headache. And the other mm -hmm. one is constipation. Constipation, you know, people can be eating all the fiber and be hydrated and do all the right things. But as soon as they, they sort their thyroid, they start to say, do you know what? For the first time ever, I'm having normal bowel movements. Mm -hmm. So you know, those are all um, symptoms of the underactive thyroid. And then we have to look for the signs uh, and the most useful signs. First of all, slow pulse, as we mentioned. Now, mm -hmm. that can be masked if you haven't sorted the diet out, because people who are eating a carbohydrate based diet with blood sugars going up and down, spiking insulin, spiking adrenaline, that can cause high blood pressure and, uh, and, and a fast pulse. So that can sometimes mask the slow pulse mm -hmm. of the underactive thyroid. But of course, that becomes apparent when you do put the diet in place. And another useful symptom is your core temperature. Because just like a car, for your car's heater to come on, you've got to have the fuel in the tank, you've got to have the engine warmed up, you've got to be going at 50 or 60 miles an hour with the thyroid accelerator pedal. Um, 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 if those energy delivery mechanisms are going slow, then your core temperature will be, sl will be low. So measuring your core temperature first thing in the morning, before you get out of bed, again, can often be a useful guide to A, diagnosing and B, getting the dose of thyroid hormones just right when all else is in place. But again, that can be masked because many of my chronic fatigue syndrome patients uh, also have a chronic infection. And if they have mm -hmm. a chronic infection, they're in, in an inflamed state. And if you are in an inflamed state, it means the immune system is busy and you may be running a low grade fever. And of course, fever is the body's attempt to get rid of an infection. 
It's a very mm -hmm. good way to get rid of infections. Of course, we know children are very good at running fevers, and so they should. Acute febrile illnesses in childhood are highly protective against pathology later on in, in life, particular heart disease and dementia and cancer. So, um, um, again, none of these symptoms or signs, you don't have to have all of them. They're all pointers. But, yeah. you know, you get a clinical picture, um, you then get the test, the, the blood test done to make sure there's biochemical scope for a trial of thyroid hormones. And then you have your hypothesis. And then you put in place a trial of thyroid hormones. And if that person is better, then you have your diagnosis. And all diagnosis is retrospective. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting, you know, that's not sort of how we normally think about it, is it? That, that the diagnosis often, you think of the diagnosis coming first and then the treatment, not the other way around. I think that's a really helpful, helpful perspective. So, because I think the way I read the book and I think the way you're explaining it is if we go back to the car analogy, putting that fuel in the tank, starting with the diet, which I'm going to ask you a question about now, um, that's all foundational, isn't it? Before you even really get to the, the full diagnosis. Yes. yes. I've got that right. Correct. Yeah. So when we're talking about diet, that can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. So can you just explain what's, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what's your take on the, the best diet for dealing with these thyroid problems? Well, or, when, yeah. Whenever I have a difficult question like that, you know, what is the best? This, what, then mm -hmm. I always go back to first principles. And that means evolutionary biology. And we have to ask, you know, what diet did primitive man and primitive woman um, uh, consume? You know, uh, what's the evolutionary correct diet? So, for example, I've got a dog. What do dogs eat? They are pure carnivores. They have, they have a, a pure meat diet, and that's what suits her best. Conversely, my horses, they eat, they eat um, uh, grass and hay, and that's the, great, the perfect diet for them. So we evolved over you know, millions of years you know, in um, um, a happy symbiosis with the environment around us, eating the foods that are available. And the same is true of humans. Uh, we evolved eating a paleo ketogenic diet. Now, paleo, uh, because this diet is uh, free from gluten grains and it's free from dairy products. You, dairy products are not evolutionary correct foods. Dairy products were meant for young mammals. If young mammals don't grow very quickly, they get eaten by saber-toothed tigers, by predators. And so the point here is dairy products are full of growth promoters, and that makes them a risk factor for cancer. Mm. We also know there's the wrong proportion of cal calcium to magnesium in dairy products. Our physiological requirements are one part calcium to one part magnesium. Dairy products have got 10 parts calcium to one part magnesium. And since mm. those two minerals compete with each other for absorption, then having a lot of dairy products will induce a magnesium deficiency. And that is a major mm. risk factor for heart disease, for osteoporosis, and for much more. In fact, magnesium has been dubbed nature's tranquilizers. So mm. for, 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 for muscles to contract, you need calcium. For them to relax, you need magnesium. And look at all the conditions we see associated with muscle spasm, which may be just magnesium deficiency. Cardiac dysrhythmia is mm. the same. Mm. So dairy products are not good for the mature um, um, uh, human being. Uh, and, and the other side of this is I came into my whole interest in this field of medicine through allergy. I was allergic to dairy products. So was my daughter. She had the most appalling colic as a baby. And the commonest allergens that come up time and time and time again, gluten grains and dairy products. So since we reckon about 30 to 40 percent of the population are allergic, you're going to sort out a lot of pathology, a lot of allergic symptoms like headache, mm -hmm. irritable bowel syndrome, arthritis, eczema, do on, simply by cutting out gluten grains and dairy products. So that's the paleo bit. Mm -hmm. And then we have the ketogenic bit. Now, the evolutionary correct fuel and the ones that our mitochondria run best on are ketones. And they come from fat and they come from fiber. So this diet should be rich in fiber and rich in fat. And that's how we fuel ourselves. It's a normal protein diet. And that necessarily makes it a low carbohydrate diet. Now, this is not a no carbohydrate diet. It's a low carbohydrate diet. And mm -hmm. there are at least two important reasons for that. Now, if you are fueling your body with carbohydrates, by which I mean sugars, starches, fruit sugars, all starches get broken down in the gut to sugars. 
So what that means is you, you eat a meal, which maybe has sugars and carbohydrates that then get broken down into, into more sugars. And those sugars are absorbed like a tsunami of sugars via the portal vein to the liver. And the liver is a magnificent sorting out house. And the idea is the liver mops up those sugars with what I call the glycogen sponge. So that grabs sugars, uh, uh, mops up by glycogen and, um, and uses that to store the sugar there. But if we're eating sugars and carbohydrates all the time, and people are, you know, what they're having for breakfast, having fruit juice and muesli and toast and marmalade and then, you know, mm. um, uh, sugar in their mm. tea and coffee mm -hmm. and, uh, and sandwich at lunchtime, you know, it's all carbohydrate based. Mm. They overwhelm that glycogen sponge and you start to spike blood sugar levels. Now, sugar in the bloodstream is very dangerous stuff. It's sticky. It sticks to things. It sticks to blood vessels and damages them. Um, it, 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 drive, it feeds cancer cells. It sticks to proteins and denatures them. So um, the body must get rid of that sugar PEQ. And it does that with insulin. So as the blood sugar rises, um, you get a spike of insulin, and that shunts the sugar into fat. Uh, and that, of course, for our autumn primitive woman was very desirable. She got fat in the autumn because we had a, a free windfall of fruits and nuts and seeds and vegetables, all carbohydrates, shunt into fat, and that's survival value for the winter. But, <laughs> but we, course, we've got winter bodies all year round. That's the, the, rest, <laughs> that the problem. That's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem yep. because we never run yep. out of, of sugars and carbs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and because they're so addictive, we go on eating them. Mm -hmm. So we're spiking mm -hmm. insulin. And then as blood sugar comes down, we spike adrenaline. And adrenaline puts the blood sugar up. It stops us sleeping. Um, it makes us, you know, uh, irritable. Dee -da, dee -da, dee -da. And then the blood sugar comes down and we start craving carbohydrates and back we go. So it caused what I call the blood sugar roller coaster, with which I'm sure you're very familiar. And that is yep. a metabolic disaster. The second thing that high carbohydrates do is they feed the, the upper gut and, and turns it into a fermenting gut. So to explain that, I'm going to have to jump sideways for a second to uh, uh, describe normal human gut function. Now, the upper gut, by which I mean the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, small intestine, you know, the first 20 odd feet or so of the gut, should be a near sterile, digesting, carnivorous gut to deal with meat and fat and eggs and fish. It's like my dog. So those, so, so my upper gut feeds mm -hmm. like a, a carnivore, like my little dog. By contrast, the lower gut, the microbiome, the last three foot of gut, the large bowel, that is full of microbes, kilograms of microbes to ferment fiber. That's a vegetarian gut. And that allows mm -hmm. us to get the goodness from fiber. So this amazing dual fuel gut allows us to eat such a wide variety of foods and partly explains you know, the success of Homo sapiens. But if you overwhelm the upper gut with sugars and carbohydrates, you're snacking all the time, you're never fasting, you know, it's constantly a drip, drip, drip feed of, of sugars and carbohydrates, you overwhelm its ability to become sterile. Um, you know, you don't have a stomach acid to deal with all that and uh, the bacteria and the yeast move in. So, of course, if you eat a large, you know, a, a bunch of grapes, for example, or, or some apples, you're consuming yeast and you're consuming fruit. Uh, you're consuming fruit sugar. And guess what happens? It ferments. It's called the autobrewery syndrome. Um, uh, first, well, first described. <laughs> by, uh, and it's a great name, isn't it? Because it illustrates. Yeah, no, I've never heard that expression before. Or, you know, like, I think everyone probably thinks they want one, but they don't, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So if you have at breakfast, you know, some, some fruit juice and some bread, you start fermenting. So we then have all the problems of the upper fermenting gut. So what does that do? Well, first of all, it ferments to produce alcohol. You know, um, uh, not just ethyl alcohol, which is what we drink when we're having a glass of wine, but propyl alcohol, butyl alcohol, uh, other substances like delactate, uh, hydrogen sulfate, ammoniacal compounds, de da de da de da. And these are all poisons to us. They, 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 they're all toxic. So suddenly mm. we, we've got a low grade acute poisoning. And guess what? If somebody gave me a glass of wine for, Christ, for, for breakfast, you know, I wouldn't be able to function in the day. But if you're having carbohydrates through the day, maybe you're doing that you know, several times a day. That's my, just, my best friend that's just popped up there. Right now. <laughs> you do everything yeah. together. The little uh, dog's behind her if you're listening. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> so, so, so that's one problem of the upper fermenting gut. And then, of course, the microbes themselves are toxic. 
Because if you look at life from the point of view of a bacteria or a yeast, it, once, it's, once it's found a little ecological niche, it doesn't want anybody else moving in there. And so fungi produce mycotoxins. And the first one we know about, of course, is penicillin. That's what Alexander Fleming was looking at in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. He had a culture of yeast with bacteria. And where the yeast colonies were, there were no bacteria around them. Why? Because they're exuding penicillin, which killed them. And, of course, most antibiotics um, are fungal derived. So we've got fungal mycotoxin in our gut. And then, of course, uh, the bacteria themselves. They produce bacterial endotoxin, and that is very toxic. I mean, the example we probably all know of is tetanus. You know, uh, people, when they get tetanus, they don't die from the mi microbe. It's not the tetanus bug that kills them. It's the toxin, tetanus toxoid, that kills them. Same mm -hmm. with claim with gangrene. It's not the, it's not the clostridia that kills them. It's the, the toxin that comes from clostridia that kills them. So these bacterial endotoxins are very toxic. And then, uh, and all this has to be dealt with by the liver. Uh, and of course, the liver is also vastly demanding energy. So again, to use the, go, go back to square one again, you know, at rest, as I mentioned, you know, the heart consumes about 7% of all our energy. The brain consumes about 20% of all our energy. The liver consumes 27% of all the energy generated in the body to deal wow. with toxins from the gut. It's mega. And mm. simply by cleaning up the upper gut, you reduce the energy the liver has to spend, and then you free it up for, for the rest of your life, for your brain, for your body, or whatever, whatever. So very often people just feel better simply for doing a paleoketogenic diet. Mm. And the third issue here, and I think this is very important, is the microbes themselves in the upper fermenting gut get into the bloodstream. It's called mm. bacterial translocation, fungal translocation. So, you know, if you brush your teeth and you had lots of bacteria in your teeth, and guess what we do? If I did a blood test two minutes later, I would see those bacteria in the bloodstream. And the same is true of the stomach. And my guess is that a huge amount of pathology is driven by allergy to those microbes from the fermenting gut. So most of the arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, Reiter syndrome, is associated with the gut dysbiosis. Um, uh, urticaria, intrinsic asthma, inflammatory bowel disease, polymyalgia rheumatica, temporal arteritis, you know, all fibromyalgia, all these conditions are driven by allergy to microbes from the upper fermenting gut. So um, it causes a huge amount of pathology. So this is why the, the paleo ketogenic diet is so important. Oh, and the the final point is, um, um, you know, we we lots of us take supplements, vitamins and minerals. Now, if the stomach is full of fermenting bacteria and fermenting yeast, then when you take nutritional supplements, you simply feed those microbes, because from an evolutionary perspective, mitochondria are actually bacteria, and hmm. that means that the requirements of our mitochondria which power every cell in our body are the same as ba what bacteria need so when you take those expensive mitochondrial supplements like coenzyme q10 acetyl l-carnitine niacin vine, if you've still got a fermenting gut you're just feeding those bugs and you're making it ferment harder so putting more why... pressure on your liver and all of that is that right yeah yep. so this yep. is why it's so important to do mm -hmm. the paleo ketogenic diet first to reduce the allergic load mm -hmm. to reduce the toxic load to stop your fermenting gut to reduce the, the microbes in your body, uh, and then you can absorb the nutrients that you need to correct your mitochondria. And then you have your mitochondria in a fit state so the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox can impact on those mitochondria. Mm. So this is why it's so important to, to do all this in the right order, just like building a house. Yeah, and you can get, I mean, okay, so I'll step back. I, I mean, I've been following a paleo-ish diet for a long time, 10 years or so at least, I think. But it was interesting reading your book. I think it's the keto component that I haven't nailed. Like I've, I've you know, I've probably wavered on that. And and so reading your book, I, was, I said to my husband the other day, oh, all right, I think I've, I've, I've got to cut the, I've got to cut down the carbs again. I've got to, I've got to do it. And actually the more you're explaining, uh, it's just solidified. I've been sucking myself up since I read it on the weekend. <laughs> I've given up the coffee. I'm already paleo, but I think it is the keto. It's the lower carb part. And actually even what you're saying makes it just 
makes a lot of sense for my own health because, you know, I'm, I don't have a gallbladder. My liver's already, you know, does a whole lot of extra work. Um, I've just before Christmas come off a whole lot of supplements because I, I, I thought my liver really needed a break. That has helped. But so it's all just sort of falling, you well, know. The supplements it, haven't helped place. for the reason that you've given. Reducing supplements have helped because you are um, – you're not feeding your fermenting gut anymore. And, and at this point, we, it's, I think it's really important to emphasize the difference between drugs and supplements. Now, mm -hmm. drugs work in the body by blocking their anti-acid, you know, anti-hypertension. And they work by inhibiting enzyme systems in the body. And that, as I call it, increases the biochemical friction in the system. Now, by mm -hmm. contrast, Nutritional supplements work by facilitating the biochemistry. They are the raw materials for the enzymes in the liver for detoxification. You know, um, uh, They are the raw materials for our mitochondria to work in energy delivery mechanisms. So they work by facilitating the biochemistry. They reduce the friction in the system. And that's mm -hmm. a very important distinction because people often mm. worry about, oh, I'm taking lots of supplements, thinking, oh, if I take supplements, I'm going to get side effects like drugs. Not so. The more supplements you take, the greater you facilitate the, uh, the biochemistry, assuming you haven't got an upper fermenting gut. Hence the yeah. importance of being keto. Yeah. Hence, yeah. Hence why I've come to the conclusion that I really need to do add the keto part into my well, I, diet I plan. About, it's not as bad as it really isn't as bad as you think. Now, one of the things I do here, which is which people love, is I run eco med weekends. So people come on the Thursday night and I talk medicine. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we eat a ketogenic diet. And by the end of the weekend, most of them are in ketosis. And we know that because we can blow a ketone breath meter and demonstrate that. And they all wow. say to me, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I'm mm. not hungry. You know, I feel better. Um, I'm in ketosis. No gut symptoms have in that very short time. I've just run down this, 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 this weekend that's not gone. We had 10, 12 people here for the weekend, had a lot of fun. Uh, and I think all 10 out of the 12 were blowing ketones by the end of the weekend. And they all said, we're going to stick with this. Wow. Yeah, that was it. So is it, it's a, 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 assuming you'd think it's worth buying one of those ketone breath okay. things. Well, the thing yeah. is, uh, you can't beat tests to know that you have arrived. And you yeah. can measure ketones in, in one of three ways. Mm. Um, um, you can, uh, but now the most accurate is blood tests. But the trouble is, I'm mm -hmm. a woman. I don't like pricking myself. And also, the test strips are expensive. They cost about a pound each. So I'm not going to do that. You can um, uh, get ketone sticks for the urine, uh, and you pee on those, and the pink color should go purple. But with time, you can get false negatives because the body gets better at matching energy delivery to energy demand. So my preferred use uh, is, is the ketone breath meter, which is very easy to use. You just turn it on like that. And it counts, there's a countdown in it. So it goes from um, uh, 20 after 20 seconds. After 20 seconds, it beeps at you. When it beeps at you, you start blowing into it. When it beeps again, you stop blowing into it. And that mm -hmm. will tell you if you're in ketosis. Um, so to give you a demonstration, here we go. Four, three, two, one, beep. When it beeps a second time, you stop. And then you wait for the reading to come up. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's uh, using still breath. So there we go. I've got 13.5 parts per million of ketos in my breath. So I know I'm in ketosis. Now, you don't have to be in ketosis all the time. Mm -hmm. Because as, as I mentioned before, we do have a glycogen sponge in our liver and in our muscles that mop up a sugar spike. So, you know, there'll be some parts of the day, you know, especially in the autumn, because I'm a gardener and I have fruit trees and blah, 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 when I'm not in ketosis, but that's okay. You mm. don't have to be in ketosis all the time. So you can take liberties. So long as you're in ketosis once a day, that's good enough for me. And the reason I say that is because um, uh, uh, we, I say the body, given two sources of fuel, sugars and, 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 uh, uh, and fats, will always get rid of sugars first because they're so damaging. So if I'm in ketosis, what that tells me is that my glycogen sponges have been squeezed dry. So I have capacity to mop up a sugar spike should it come along, but, um, uh, 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 but so I, I, I'm, and that's good enough. And um, so the keto meter I think is well worth doing because then you, you, know, you can't cheat a test. 
and you can't kid yourself and think, oh, I think I must be in ketosis because, yeah, yeah. because, because. And guess yeah. what? We are very good at fooling ourselves. <laughs> oh, yeah. We can convince ourselves of anything that we want to. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, I think I could talk to you. I think, you know, if you were closer, I'd come to one of your weekends. I love listening to uh, people passionate about yes. holistic health. I can just listen for hours and Absolutely. hours and hours. So. Next time I come to Wales, slip, I'll, I'll come to one book of in. the weekends. <laughs> book in. But if you're listening from over there, go book in. Um, so, but I'm mindful that, you know, it's, uh, I, I can talk to you for, for, for hours and hours. But I think what you're saying is, I mean, that is the, that's, that's your fuel. So you've got to get that right first. So if you're listening and you're not sure where to start, is that where you'd say start? Start with the diet yes. piece. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and look, and it's, it's never, never the whole picture. I say that too, like diet's really core. You can get so much bang for buck with diet, but it's not the whole, you know, so, no, it's, so the, do it's the that. foundation stones. And guess what? Mm. I don't want to live on just, you know, a, a block of concrete. The next thing you have to do is you have to b build the mitochondrial walls and, uh, and the, the thyroid accelerator pedal roof and chimneys. Mm. Yeah. Then, then you get into all the fun, yeah, the fun creative stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, I think, it, I mean, without talking for another hour, we, we maybe we'll leave it at the, that foundational step because I think you do in the book go through a whole lot of you know all the other all the other steps, yeah, and you've got a correct. book specifically on the paleo keto component as well. I know you go over that in the book, but you've got a whole book on that as well. Um, but the underactive thyroid book does go through beyond, you know, beyond the diet piece. And you talk, yeah, a lot. There's a lot of detail in there about the, the other steps. But, so, I mean, aside from if, you, if you're getting the foundations right, is there, I mean, is there something that you would want to highlight from the rest of, you know, the other components or, well, or the, do we the, just leave it the at next that? The next component is the mm. mitochondrial engine. But if your energy levels are sort of, 70% of what they should be or more, it's unlikely you've got a mitochondrial issue. Uh, if your energy component is, you know, 30% of what it should be, then you probably have got a mitochondrial issue. And I explain all that in my book, you know, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. It's mitochondria, not hypochondria. Yeah. So let's mm -hmm. fast forward to the thyroid and say, okay, mm. we know we're not functioning. We've got many of the thyroid symptoms um, uh, that we've talked about, the fluid retention, the edema, um, um, uh, Sleep disturbance is another useful clue here because our thyroid hormones are partly responsible for our circadian rhythm. So what should happen is we should, um, you know, we should be exposed to light in the day. Um, primitive woman, guess what? She was out in, in the light 12 hours a day. And then as light falls, that stimulates the pineal gland to produce melatonin. Melatonin is the sleep hormone. And as melatonin levels rise, that kicks the pituitary gland into action. And it's the pituitary gland that produces thyroid stimulating hormone. So the level of TSH spikes at about midnight. TSH then goes around the body to the thyroid gland and that kicks the thyroid gland into life. And so it starts to produce T4. T4 is fairly inactive, but that spikes at four o'clock in the morning. T4 mm -hmm. is then slowly converted to T3. It's T3, which is the active hormone, and that spikes at five o'clock in the morning. Then T3 trickles around the body to the adrenal gland, and that kicks the adrenal gland into life. And the adrenal gland throws out adrenaline and cortisol and DHA at about six o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning, and that's what actually wakes us up. Now, it is a characteristic of the underactive thyroid person that they are owls. And they will tell me, I can't get off to sleep until <coughs> one o'clock in the morning, something. And I don't wake up until eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. So that is a, another very useful clue. Hmm. And another useful clue is what I call ketogenic hypoglycemia. It's a dreadful name. But normally, you know, primitive woman was running on, key, on, on fat and she would fat burn with thyroid hormones. Now, if you haven't got the thyroid hormones, you will fat burn with adrenaline instead. And it's adrenaline that gives you the wired but tired feeling. Uh -huh. So if people say, oh, yeah, I've done the keto diet and yeah, okay, I'm in ketosis, but I still feel terrible. I still feel like I'm hypoglycemic and I'm spiking adrenaline. Then that would point to an underactive thyroid because your need for thyroid hormones will increase a little bit on the ketogenic diet. Another clue to um, the underactive thyroid 
is you get a proximal myopathy. Uh, so people say they can't do press ups, they can't do squats because the muscles around their shoulder girdle, the muscles around their between their hip and their knees, they've gone weak. And uh, and that's a good sign that they've got an undirected thyroid. So do you do lots of press ups every morning, Annabelle? I do do some. Um, I do do some. I I do um, yeah I do I do do some and I do good. you know squats and lunges and Fantastic. You know, lift weights. Fantastic. But I definitely have that fatigue, that weakness. Yeah, yep. I definitely. Absolutely. When I Absolutely. read that in your book, I hadn't seen anybody. I haven't. I hadn't noticed that in other thyroid things, and I was. I highlighted that. I'm like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the week, you know. Yeah, but yeah. Brilliant. Well, the, well, when I got yeah. myself started on thyroid, you know, my maximum used to be about 20 press ups I could do. I can now do 35 just. So wow, I know wow, well that my muscles have got mm. a bit stronger. And, and that's yeah. very important because loss of muscle is, is, a, 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 is a feature of aging and is a big mm. problem because if you lose muscle, you're going to fall over. And guess what? People fall over and break bones and that kills them. So, you know, keeping your muscles strong is a really yeah. important part of, of, of aging. Yeah. Yeah. I've so, been doing a lot of reading and listening about that, the importance of yeah, really feeding you, your muscles and building muscles. So yeah, I think that's So good. hopefully yeah. we've now got, you know, the clinical picture mm -hmm. of the underactive thyroid. And the mm -hmm. next thing we have to do is we have to do some blood tests. And the most, the main, there are two reasons to do the blood test. The first is to make absolutely certain that you don't have an overactive thyroid, because the last thing you want to do is use thyroid glands in somebody who is overactive. But that's rare. You know, usually with an overactive thyroid, you know it, the pulse is racing, you're shaky, uh, you're losing weight, you're sleepless, you know, you're hyped up and so on. It's usually very obvious. Uh, and the second reason is to see if there is biochemical scope for a trial of thyroid hormones. So when we're looking at the blood test, the bare minimum we need is a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, a T4, which as we mentioned is, is rather inactive, and a T3, which is the active component. And there are, uh, and so, so let's start off by looking at the TSH. Now the TSH is what rises when we have primary hypothyroidism. The thyroid gland itself has gone down. And guess what? Autoimmune thyroiditis is extremely common and this wretched COVID vaccine is making it a lot more common. We're poisoning our thyroid gland with fluoride. We poison it with glyphosate, organophosphates and organochlorines. We poison it with heavy metals like mercury from dental amalgam, aluminium and so on. So our thyroid is extremely susceptible to toxic stress, and um, uh, and that's why we're seeing so much of it. But the um, so so the TSH is helpful. Now I like to see the TSH below one point five. That's international units. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in America, the threshold for prescribing thyroid hormones is anybody with a TSH above three, but some bodies won't start prescribing thyroid hormones until the TSH is above ten. So ten, it all, wow! Yeah, it all depends on definition, and uh, and mm. and so that I mean, I just saw a lady yesterday who'd had a TSH of four, five, six for the past seven years, and nobody had thought to try on thyroid hormones, and so she'd had wow. she'd lost seven years of her life effectively. It's terrible. So I think in Australia it's around four. So here in Australia it's around four. Well, my view is that's still too mm. high. But so, yeah. for example. Um, thyroid hormones are particularly important in pregnancy and the TSH is inversely proportionate to the IQ of the baby. So if you've got a high TSH, you're going to have a baby with a low IQ because thyroid hormones are essential for brain and nerve development. So mm. guess what? You know, you know, if I was having pregnant, having babies, I want to have a low TSH because I want my child to have a high <laughs> IQ. Yeah. And in pregnancy, the threshold for prescribing thyroid hormones is anybody with a TSH below 1.5. So mm. what does that tell you? So why should it be different in pregnancy yeah. than the rest of the life? There's no logic there whatsoever. Um, mm. So that's the first thing. The second thing we look at is T4, thyroxine. Now, as we said, that's not very active. But because the underactive thyroid is so common, the way that medicine has dealt with that is by changing the normal ranges. So my reference range for free T4 is 12 to 22 picomoles per litre. In fact, Professor Sir Anthony Toft, who wrote the British Medical Association Guide to Treating Hypothyroidism, in his book, 
He states, some people don't feel well until their free T4 is running at 30 peak moles per litre. So perhaps wow. the reference range should be 12 to 30. Wow. But um, some NHS laboratories in this country, their reference range is 7 to 14 peak moles per litre. Mm. It's disastrously low. So that mm. means you're going to miss a huge number of, of people who may mm. well benefit from a, a trial of, of, of thyroglandias and getting their reference ranges up. So that's the second mm. point. Then the third thing that needs measuring, and this is rarely measured in this country, um, is the T3. Now, it's T3, which is the active thyroid hormone. It's T3, which actually does the business. And to convert T4 to T3, you need um, uh, cofactors such as selenium and zinc. Now, selenium and zinc deficiency in this country is pandemic. If you've got an upper fermenting gut, and you're not taking supplements, you will be deficient in selenium and you will be deficient in zinc. And that means you might have a very low T3. And if that's not measured, then we don't know all about that. So you see a fairly okay TSH, you see a T4 that's maybe, you know, 19 or 20 or 21, think, oh, that's all right. But if the T3 is 2.9 or 3.1, it's not all right. So we need a T3 to diagnose T3 hypothyroidism, or rather to hypothesize T3 hypothyroidism. So if any one of those tests are uh, uh, borderline or low, and the ca case of TSH borderline high, certainly if it's above three, and you've got the clinical symptoms and the clinical signs, and maybe the clinical history too, because of course we know the underactive thyroid is much more common in women. Um, it's often slow onset in action. It often runs in families. So if mother, grandmother, you know, uh, auntie had the underactive thyroid, you know, think that. It may be triggered by a vaccination. And we know COVID va uh, vaccines are very good at triggering the underactive thyroid. It may be triggered by a viral infection. We know that can rub out your thyroid gland. And it may be triggered by a whiplash injury. Now, I broke my neck three times uh, doing competitive horse riding, and I'm fairly sure that's what did for my thyroid. But mm. a major trigger for the underactive thyroid is the menopause. In fact, my lovely publishers asked me to write a book about the menopause. So I said, well, it's all in my other book. But she said, no, we want a book <laughs> called The Menopause. And the point here is that female sex hormones give us false energy. They give us the appearance of having lots of energy when we actually don't. And I think there is an evolutionary reason for that. Um, because the only reason we are here on this planet if, is for the business of procreation. We're only here to have babies. If we don't have babies, then the human race is going to vanish very quickly. And um, in order to attract a partner, you have to give the impression that you've got lots of energy because you're not going to find a sexual partner. You don't have the energy to rear children. <laughs> yeah. so, so energy is an essential part of procreation. And if we mm. have the energy, then the body will generate female sex hormones. And the female sex hormones make us look sexy, um, uh, don't worry, I don't have them anymore. <laughs> they make us look sexy. <laughs> they make us look cheerful. I'm, I'm, I'm holding on for all I can get. <laughs> <laughs> they make us look cheerful and jolly, and they make they also make us do mad things, don't they? Like jump into bed with a complete stranger and expose ourselves to sexually transmitted diseases. But that's another story. So, female sex hormones give us false energy. So when we go through the menopause, suddenly we don't have those, and we get fatigued. And many doctors say, oh, we'll just prescribe you HRT. But as we know, HRT is very dangerous medicine. How do we know that? The million women year HRT study, where they took a million women who were taking HRT and they just followed them up. After 18 months, it had to be stopped because of the excess cancers in, the, in that group of women. So HRT is dangerous medicine and not an option. But very often, the menopause unmasks an underlying hypothyroidism. So if that woman has recently gone through the menopause and that's where her symptoms date from, then that increases the likelihood that they have an underactive thyroid. So with all those clinical pictures and the slow pulse and, and, the, and the ketogenic hypoglycemia because the um, PK diet isn't working for you, then we do a trial of thyroid hormones. Now, remember, it's a trial. It doesn't mean you're going to be on thyroid for life. It is a trial, and it all depends on your response to treatment. And now we have taken, the, you know, we've cleaned up the muddy clinical waters. We know they're not ill because, you know, of the DAR or because the mitochondria, because of because the fermenting gut, because we sorted all that. Then we can see the response to the thyroid hormones. And very often we have to do this in parallel with adrenal hormones because, again, 
the adrenal gland tends to fail with age. But let's assume we, we now have a, simply a thyroid problem. The key is we start on thyroid glandulars and we start with very low doses and we build up very slowly. And there's two reasons for that. Well, well maybe more. Um, first of all, um, 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 we have to have the uh, mitochondria in a fit state to um, respond. Uh, so we've got to get the mitochondria health right. Secondly, um, uh, uh, thyroid hormones also determine the number of thyroid hormones, uh, the number of mitochondria. So the number of mitochondria is like the difference between driving a car with a little engine and driving the car with a big engine. So, you know, in this country, we have a, a Mini, which has got a little engine that just creeps along the road. And we also have a Rolls Royce, which bombs along the road. Guess what? I want to have a Rolls Royce. I want to have <laughs> lots of mitochondria. And that is determined by thyroid hormones. So mm. we have to start low and build up slow. And the third reason is that thyroid hormones are quite long acting in the body. So they're not gone in a day, you know, the half life of them, maybe a day or, or several days. So you, the, it bioaccumulates in the body. And if you go too quickly, you will miss, miss that sweet mm. spot of the optimum dose and you will overdose and end up, you know, shaky, sleepless, yeah. da -de -da -de -da. so it's so mm. important to start low and go slow and get that sweet spot. And in the book, I detail the sort of doses that you can expect to take to hit that sweet spot and it's weight mm. dependent. So I'm about nine and a half stone and I uh, take um, uh, uh, 120 milligrams of thyroid glandular, which is equivalent to about two grains. That's the old fashioned method of dosing. Um, uh, uh, but somebody who was uh, a big person, maybe 16, 20, they would need more than that for obvious reasons. It's simply weight dependent. And also mm. remember that as your weight comes down and very often, by dint of doing the PK dart and sorting out their thyroid ingredients, weight just normalizes easily because on the PK dart, you feel very satisfied. You don't overeat because, you know, fat and fiber are not addictive like sugars and carbohydrates are. The weight comes down and normalizes easily. So very often you might find you have to reduce your dose as the weight comes down. And again, there's a fourth form of the underactive thyroid, which, um, which is thyroid hormone receptor resistance, i.e., You've got the thyroid hormones there, but the body isn't reacting to it, responding to mm -hmm. it. Now, we're not quite sure what causes that. We know some of the things that causes it. We know it can be caused by heavy metals um, and some pesticides. But my guess, and this is only a guess at this stage, my guess is that there are products of the upper fermenting gut, all the things we mentioned mm -hmm. like D-lactate, mm -hmm. hydrogen sulfide, ammoniacal compounds, alcohol, which also cause thyroid hormone receptor resistance. So I don't know this, but it's biologically plausible. But guess what? We've sorted that all out, haven't we? Because we've sorted out our fermenting mm -hmm. gut. So, um, and, and of course the business of, of, of losing weight, of improving our life, means that we're going to detox naturally. So we're going to reduce our load of, 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 of heavy metals and toxins simply by doing all the things that we've talked about. So we're not going to talk a lot about thyroid hormone receptor resistance because we've kind of done it. Mm. Yeah. I'm just wondering, can you just briefly explain the thyroid? Um, oh, sorry, it's getting late, my brain. Um, the glandulars, sorry, glandulars. Oh, yes. Because most people are, are prescribed synthetic T4 replacement, not glandulars. So okay. can you just brief, briefly explain what that is and how do you go about getting it? Okay. Well, um, uh, the, the very first case of the underactive thyroid occurred in the 1890s, and she was treated with thyroid from a lamb, from, from sheep. But um, um, glandulars are simply dried pig thyroid gland or dried cow thyroid gland. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, thyroid hormones are very stable. Thankfully, they're well absorbed in the gut. Uh, they're better absorbed sublingually. So I always recommend you take them under the tongue. And, um, and that is the best and the most physiological and the most natural way to replace like with like. We're actually very similar to pigs <laughs> in, in terms of physiology and many other <laughs> yeah. aspects of pigs too. I keep pigs. I love them, but they're greedy. Ah. <laughs> they're <intelligent laughs> So, yeah. um, so, so glandulars are simply dried animal thyroid glands. Of course, mm. the drug company didn't like that because they can't make any money out of that. And that's why they made their synthetic T4 and their synthetic T3. Now, 
thyroid glandulars come in two grades. They come in pharmaceutical grade, where it's thyroid glandulars, and then they measure the exact amount of T4 and T3 in there, and they tweak it a little bit. And we end up with preparations like Armour Thyroid, Thyroid S, um, um, Generic Thyroid, uh, Thyroid BP, and so on. But we also have food grade thyroid glandulars. Um, mm. uh, and of course, all those pharmaceutical grades, they all need a prescription. Mm -hmm. Now, the joy yeah. of food grade glandulars is they're exactly the same thing. They're just thyroid glandulars dried, but they're food grade and they do not need a prescription. And they are mm. widely available throughout the world. And in the index mm. of my book, I detail all the companies in the world and they're spread all over the world. That where you can purchase thyroid glandulars from. And I put the price in there um, in dollars so that you can uh, so people internationally can see how much it costs. And they mm. are there's no doubt they're active. They work extremely well. They're extremely safe and they're, the thyroid hormones in, are very stable. So there's no question they do work. Yeah, that's re well, that's really interesting. I didn't know you could get them uh, like that. So, yeah, that's mm. that's great. And I think from memory, a lot of them, I mean, for my local listeners, a lot come from New Zealand. Uh, that's right. Coming from, from New Zealand. Yeah, very good quality grass-fed beef and, and that's what we want. Uh, I mean, New Zealand got because... Um, uh, of course, we have the BSE epidemic in this country and that mm. was attributed to eating rendered meat. Um, I, um, I don't believe that was the case. I think it's another cause. But anyway, of course, that didn't happen in New Zealand. Your cattle are grass fed because you've got lots of lovely grass and lots of lovely land. So um, it's going to be BSE free. And I don't think you've had a case of BSE in New Zealand either. So that helps, too. So, yes, you have um, 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 BSE free cattle. So your cattle thyroid glanders will be absolutely perfect. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, look, and I'm in Australia, so it's just, just across the ditch. We say just across the ditch in New Zealand, <laughs> all that beautiful uh, New Zealand green grass. So, yeah, they, all their grass-fed cows are so good for so many different things. Look, Sarah, I'm going to wrap it up because, I honestly, I could keep talking to you. I've got, I don't know, three or four or five at least questions that we haven't even touched on. But I think it's always good to leave people wanting a bit more. And so I really want to thank you. Just I've just listened, absorbed. One of the things I like to do when I go back and edit the podcast is I really listen. That's when I'll go and make notes. And, uh, and I, I usually get so much more out of the conversation because um, I'm just really just listening to absorb. So, um, but I really want to thank you for... Yeah, wow, for all the work that you have done to got to get to this point, to have this depth of knowledge to share not only with your own patients but with thyroid and, and you know, other suffering people around the world who don't want to suffer anymore and who want to, you know, yeah, take take their health into their own hands. So Correct. thank you. The key take-home message is do it yourself because you must and because you can. Yeah, excellent. Well, look, um, Sarah, is – is there a, a way that people can connect with you? Like, how would you, you know, like people to well, connect well, with I you? Well, I do regular, uh, um, if you look at my website, drmyhill.co.uk, uh, there I do online workshops where I talk all day to people with fatigue syndromes. I do Zoom groups uh, every two months to, to anybody and everybody, and it's free. Anybody can sign up and listen to me yapping away on whatever subject. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then, of course, there are the books. Um, which my publisher would love you to buy, of course. <laughs> and it's all in the books. And I, I can't put all the information in my books on my website because my publisher would go nuts she, she, because, you know, she wants people to, to purchase a few books. But there's an awful lot on my website. I think it's had about 23 million hits since its inception. So it's very popular. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, look, thank you. Yeah, thank you again. I'll make sure I link in the description to all those, you know, all those things and obviously to to the latest book, but I'll put, I'll throw the paleo keto book in there, link as well. And the, I think we're chronic, I'll, I'll see what I could find and I'll, I'll link it all as well, Bless send you. everybody to you. But yeah, thanks again. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful that we've connected. Now it is time to kiss. <laughs> Keep it super simple. This is our Kiss Thyroid Coaching segment just for a minute or two at the end of the episode to help you to stop and think and reflect because there was a lot of information in that conversation and it would be really easy just to hit stop, get on with the rest of your day and you know, just think, oh my gosh, that was a lot and really not benefit from it. So that's the point of these little segments at the end. So what is one thing, just one thing that you could take away from this conversation that you could 
start to implement or start to research, perhaps start to look into? What's just what's one thing? So have a think about that. And I would love you to share what that one thing is in the Let's Talk Thyroid Facebook community. That would be amazing um, because your one thing might be, you know, someone else's one thing and you can have a chat about it and get some support. Uh, or, you know, you might, your one thing might stimulate a conversation in the group that's going to benefit someone else. I can tell you that, uh, well, my one thing, as I said in the episode, is to start trying the paleo keto approach to diet. I uh, definitely have found um, I've been gaining a bit of weight recently and need to do something about it. <laughs> uh, I'm not too hung up on weight. I've done a lot of work, self-work on not getting too hung up on that and to really focus more on health than on weight. But I'm also mindful I'm coming in, you know, in that perimenopausal period and I don't want to be gaining weight unnecessarily. And so I, th I do think this is something that I'm going to explore. I am seeing my doctor on Wednesday, so I'll have a chat with her about it as well. Uh, and it's Monday today when I'm recording. So I've, I've started today. That's my plan is to, is to try the keto, try to get my body into ketosis by reducing the carbs. That's my one thing. Maybe your one thing is getting a copy of her book. Uh, maybe your one thing is to just start that foundational level with paleo or even gluten, grain, dairy free, like just start somewhere. But as she says, that's the foundations for, you know, on which everything else builds. Perhaps it, you know, you've already got all the foundations nailed and you want to explore thyroid glandular as a way of, you know, as a form of thyroid replacement. So many different things you could do. Pick your one. Just do that one, share it with me in some for forum, whether it's the uh, Let's Talk Thyroid Facebook community, whether it is on Instagram or private message or email, just share it because that helps add accountability as well. So thanks everyone for listening and I will see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Thyroid. If you have enjoyed the content or perhaps you're thinking, oh, my mum needs to hear this or my sister or my bestie, I would love it if you would share this episode with them. That really just helps spread the positive and practical message of Let's Talk Thyroid and helps um, that broader thyroid community, our friends and family to live well with their thyroid health. So you can just yeah share the episode. If you subscribe uh, on whatever platform you're listening to, uh, to this podcast, it's free. Uh, it's really helpful because then you'll be notified every time a new podcast comes out and it just makes it much easier to find. There's usually a little subscribe button or a bell or um, a follow often is the terminology. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be helpful. Of course, if you want to leave a review, even better, just a sentence or two about how the podcast has helped you. You can definitely connect with me via letstalkthyroid.com. That's where you'll find access to my book, my coaching, uh, my freebies, and really everything that I offer in terms of thyroid support. 